Hey, welcome to Gold Scratch. So I'm going to start this video today with a few questions. Uh, what's the difference between iron and steel? Uh, what's a pink rod? Why is a pink rod pink? And why is it better than a regular rod? What's 4340 steel? You see that a lot in advertising for crankshafts and connecting rods. Is it good? And what makes it good? What's the difference between 1040 and 4340? What are your connecting rods made out of? Today I'm going to answer that and a whole bunch of other questions about metallurgy as it applies uh, to engines. And so, welcome to Gold Scratch. I got my good wife, Mariana, is my camera lady today. I don't have Mike here, so I don't have the ability to do screenshots. We're going to have her zoom in when the time comes on my, uh, on my uh, visual aids here in a minute and give you as much information as we can. We'll try to make up for all that by providing more information and my focus is always to provide uh, videos that are informational and informative and that's what we're going to do today. So, uh, by the way, please like and subscribe before I forget. Uh, we're on a path to get our 5,000 subscribers. As I mentioned in previous videos, subscribers are what makes making videos make sense. And I need, by October 10th, to get 5,000 subscribers. I made a compassionate plea on the previous videos. It got huge response, but I'm not there yet. So I need you to help me out. Costs you nothing. Helps me a lot. Okay, what's the difference between, between iron and steel? So steel essentially is refined iron. Uh, and one of the biggest differences is uh, steel has about 0.4% carbon in it. Uh, 1040 steel, for example, that's what the 4O stands for, the percentage of carbon. And, and iron has about 4% carbon. So uh, if you live in a big city like Chicago or Detroit or Cleveland, where they have a lot of steel mills, uh, and you drive by and you see those great big tall structures that are about 300 feet high, uh, those are probably blast furnaces. So blast furnaces are where uh, cast iron is made originally and from raw materials, uh, iron ore, coal, which is turned into coke by refining it, and limestone, and they can make a lot of it at a time. Those blast furnaces can make 10 or 12,000 tons of cast iron per day. And so when that iron comes out of there, it's about 26 or 700 degrees Fahrenheit. It's molten, of course, so it can flow. Uh, and it's got 4% carbon. So it's essentially useless in that form. Some of it goes down the line in the steel mill and gets turned into steel, and some gets captured and sold as pig iron. So is pig iron bad? No, it's not bad. The reason they call it pig iron, they have to cool it down into small forms, a uh, little shape, it's like a little uh, cubicle, and water cool it, and when they do and it cools down, the shape looks like little pigs, so that's why they call it pig iron. So there's nothing wrong with pig iron. Pig iron is really just cast iron. In a steel mill, if you want to make steel for your connecting rod or fender of your car, goes through another batch process in a vessel, two or 300 tons at a time in a batch process where uh, high pressure and high volume, pure oxygen uh, is inserted into a bath of iron and that frees up the carbon. The longer it's, that process goes on, the more carbon gets freed up and out comes steel, which is once again about 0.4% carbon and it depends on the application. That's the difference between steel and iron. Both have applications and both are good for what they are and what they do. And I'm going to explain that for you today. So, so first of all, cast iron, if you have a, a small block shav or a Ford or a Dodge, doesn't matter what it is, the cylinder heads, the block, most of those parts like that are made out of cast iron. So uh, foundries that make those blocks buy that pig iron and now it's cooled down. It can be handled almost like big gravel with front end loaders and stuff. They melt it down again. They raise it to 26 or 2700 degrees and they add some alloying elements to it like 
uh, uh, chrome, nickel, moly to improve the physical characteristics of it. And they produce what's called no nodular or ductile iron. So at the bottom of the hierarchy of the scale is uh, cast iron, which is 70,000 PSI. Then nodular iron is 95,000 PSI and it's the same iron with some alloys added, okay? So that's it for iron. Um, applications of anything, once again, cylinder blocks. The problem is they still have a high percentage of carbon. Carbon, it makes it strong. The more carbon it is, the stronger it is, but the more brittle it is. So that's why your, your cylinder block is more prone to cracking than say a uh, steel part, for example. So. So if you want to make a connecting rod or a crankshaft, uh, typically now you want uh, steel. So the grades of steel are uh, 5140 is one of them. So before I get too far down the road, I worked in a steel mill most of my life. There we had more than 500 different grades of steel. I'm showing you just a few here and the approximate strengths, the strengths can vary uh, drastically because especially these steels like uh, 1040, 4340 uh, can be heat treated and that can change the physical characteristics of it uh, dramatically. These are just the common numbers that are probably the most common. So 5140 is commonly used in, in uh, things like crankshafts, etc. It's a good, fairly economical steel. Uh, if I can jump ahead just the way to describe it, 4340 stands for one of the Best steels used not only in, in cars, engines, crankshafts, connecting rods, but in, in, in heavy industry and in the aircraft industry, 4340 is a very, very uh, common uh, steel to be used when you really need performance, high strength, high durability, resistance to cracking, etc. It's the material of choice. So. 4340, what does that stand for? 4340 uh, uh, is it's the alloy in the steel. So you have moly is the main one. There's three different uh, ingredients, moly, chrome, and nickel. And the last uh, two numbers, 0.40 or the 40 stands for the percentage of carbon, which is 0.4% carbon in 4340. So a lot of aftermarket, high-end connecting rods and crankshafts now are being made out of that. It's a great product. So if it's so good, why doesn't they use it all the time? Because it's very expensive. The alloys like chrome, nickel, and moly are expensive. They drive up the cost, and if they're not necessary, they don't get used. And so therefore, a lot of other steels like 1040 get used. If you have a small block Chevrolet or probably a Dodger or Ford, once again, I know Chev's better, unfortunately, but the connecting rods in it are 1040 steel. When I say 1040, they could be 1038 to 1042, something in that range, uh, that grade right here. And so they do not have as much chrome, nickel, or moly as a 4340 steel. And there's a relative strength. So 40, 5140 is approximately 115,000 PSI tensile strength, and 1040 is 120, 4340 is 145,000 PSI tensile strength. So as you get up the food chain, it gets more expensive, uh, and of course, uh, a better quality product. While I'm at 1040, the connecting rod in your small block Chevrolet is 1040. So why is a pink rod pink? And what's better about a pink rod? A pink rod and small block Chevrolet and GM Chevrolet used them, started in the 60s and 70s. If they're a high, high end application, like a 302 Z28 engine, fuel injected Corvette engine, for example, had pink rods. What's the difference? The pink rods were magnaflux, which is just a term for a magnetic particle inspection. So here's a rod. Uh, they would actually uh, sprinkle uh, small uh, powder uh, iron onto the rod, induce a strong magnetic field, and if there's a crack anywhere in the rod, 
the powder would line up with the crack, and that's how you could tell if there's a crack. And that's called magnetic particle inspection or magnifluxing. Most every machine shop has the capability and do this on a regular basis. Phase one. The next thing is their shot peen. And shot, what shot peening does is just put the rod in a tank or in a fixture, bombard it with uh, hardened BBs at high speed. And what that does is, uh, is stress relieves the surface of it and reduces the chances of it having cracked. So yeah, if you don't have a pink rod, uh, you can magnaflux it and you can stress relieve it. And it's exactly the same as a pink rod. And so why are they pink? The GM or the manufacturer put a little splash of pink paint on them so they'd know which ones were uh, Magnaflux and, and uh, shot peen and which ones weren't. That's all a pink rod is about. So pink rods are 1040 steel. So as you can see, in an application for a small block chev that makes 350 or 400 horsepower, more or even more than that, more than adequate. Okay, so you do not need anything better than that. So the next one on the food chain is called powder metallurgy uh, rods or cracked rods. So what the heck does that mean? So almost prevalent in the industry now, whether it's uh, with OEM, North American produce products or, or offshore European products, whatever, powder metallurgy connected rods are prevalent. So the difference is, instead of forging them, these rods are forged, which means they, they're heated to a high temperature, the steel is heated to a high temperature, and hammered into a form until it looks like a rod. And then it needs a lot of machining. Uh, when that's done, it needs to, have, needs to be uh, saw cut, spread part, uh, the first surfaces have to be finished, back together, bore the hole, bore the pinhole, drill the holes for here, and a whole bunch of expensive machining, and there's a lot of yield loss, there's a lot of material gets mess, gets uh, cut off. So in a powder metallurgy rod, they heat up all the ingredients to a high temperature and put them into a huge press, a very, very high pressure press, and out comes a near net shape of a connecting rod. It needs, it's very, very accurate, more accurate uh, than, a, than a rod like this, and it has a lot less yield uh, and therefore way cheaper for less expensive for the OEMs to manufacture and stronger. As you can see in the hierarchy here, powder metallurgy rods are like 170,000 PSI. So we're getting up the food chain. And why do they call them cracked rods? They do not saw cut. They actually put them in a fixture and put a stress point on them to create a point of breakage and actually fracture them. And when you put them back together, all the little rough and green, rough surfaces of the fracture go back together and that helps to even make it stronger. So that's why they call them fractured rods. Titanium and tool steel, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. It's uh, expensive and you're not going to use it in your small block Chev or your small block Ford. Uh, typically, so we're going to go right by that. So I've been talking about PSI, and just to give you a relative uh, feel for it, uh, if you have grade 5 bolt, you're familiar with grade 5 bolts, uh, they're probably about 10 1040 p uh, steel. And for, if you have grade 8 bolts, it's 4340 steel, just to give you a, a relative uh, point that you can connect to. So I keep talking about PSI, pounds per square inch. So what does that mean? So if you have exactly a, a shaft that's one square inch in diameter and you put it in tension and it's got a strength of 120,000 PSI, it's going to fail at 120,000 PSI. That's 60 tons. That's a lot. That's what PSI means. That's the failure point. And on my graph here, if you've looked at... If you looked at my previous, I made a, a video a while ago about fasteners. So I'm reusing the graph, but I've added some uh, points to it to apply to what we're talking about today. So that's the stress strain curve for steel. So on this line is the stretch or the elongation. 
And in this line is the stress or the torque that you're applying or the force that you're applying, okay? If you're tightening a bolt, it's a torque. But if it's a connecting rod at top dead center at 7,000 RPM, it's a stretch, okay? So, so as you increase the force, it stretches. And as long as you're in the elastic range where the line is straight like this, if you relax that force, it goes right back down the line that it came from. So if it starts off at whatever dimension is, it goes down to exactly the same dimension. If you keep going past that point where it's called the yield point, then it continues to stretch. It's getting longer, but the force isn't going up. If you stop now, when you take the force off or you untorque it, or if it's a bolt, untorque it, it goes back down the red line, and now it's got permanent elongation, okay? So essentially, it's failed. So when you torque a bolt, kind of covering what I mentioned in the fasteners, typically the, the bolt torque recommendation for a cylinder head on a small block shev, 65 foot-pounds, is about 75% of the yield point. So you're always in a safe range. This is called the elastic range, where the line is straight, okay? So you're always a long way from yielding. You still have sufficient force. When you undo the torque, it goes right back down on the straight line. If you keep going, then you get into, this is elastic. This is called plastic range. Now, as you keep going, the stretch continues. So if you've ever torqued a bolt and you're tightening your torque wrench, and it feels really good and all of a sudden it gets easier instead of harder to pull and you're pulling more and the force isn't going up and you get that sick feeling in your stomach knowing you, you just ruined the bolt uh, that's you're in this elastic range right here or plastic range here so once you come here you can't go back so tensile or ultimate strength is the maximum stress you can have before the bolt goes into final failure, which is fracture where it actually breaks. So it's going down here, your force is actually going down as the stretch is going up. So that's true whether it's a bolt or whether it's a connecting rod or a crankshaft or anything else. That's what's going on inside your engine. So, so uh, I hope you found that helpful, if there's interest, I can give you, I uh, can go as deep as you want to go, I guess, on this subject. I worked in a steel mill most of my life, so um, uh, I can talk about that forever. Uh, but that's some practical, common uh, uh, examples. And so, before I forget, we've got three other projects going on at Gold Scratch. We've got Mike Kimball's budget build. We're gonna finish that job for you. Uh, he's just not available right now. We've got other things to do. My 400 small block with the AFR leaking heads. I got to go to build a little shop and make that video. So we've got to set that up. And I've made two videos on understanding camshafts and I will finish that project. I just had this stuff going around in my head and I thought I might as well get it out there before I, uh, well, I got to focus on it and get it done and we'll come back to the other stuff. Tip of the day. I promised you a tip of the day. And so today is always read all the instructions. We used to have a saying when I was starting off working and this stuff is, when all else fails, read the instructions. It's funny, but it's not really very smart because it can get you in big trouble. So what's worse than finishing a job and you go to throw the box away for the part you just installed and the instructions fall out and you read them and you realize you didn't put it together right or did it wrong. And you got that gut feeling like you got to do it over again or you did damage or you're going to make it fail or whatever. Don't have that. Find the instructions before you even start. Read them all. Make sure you have a complete and total understanding of everything that you have to do before you start. While you're in there, there's also another booklet or another page about warranty. So read the warranty. But remember this. Instructions are written by somebody who wants the project to be successful. They want the part to work. They want you to be satisfied. And warranties are written by lawyers who want to make sure that if it doesn't work out, that you think it's your fault. That's the way they work it. So be careful when you read the warranty. Read the instructions first, and you won't need to use the warranty, probably. Thank you for watching. Once again, like and subscribe. Uh, we're enjoying the channel. I need that 5,000 subscribers, so we're not there yet. 
So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button, and thank you for watching Gold's Garage.